great to see you all here this morning. I know that a number of us uh, throughout our church family are kind of under the weather, so I wasn't sure how that might affect our attendance. It's great to see you all. And I hope that you had a great uh, Christmas and New Year's. It's kind of a, you know, as we you come off the holidays and you kind of get back in the New Year, and it's like uh, it's sometimes tough to kind of get going and get started. So I'm, I'm glad you're here, and I'm excited about what God has for us as we start into this new year, and particularly as we look at uh, the Gospel of Mark. You know, as followers of Jesus, you and I live in an era that has been called the already, but not yet. Because Jesus' kingdom has already come with the arrival of Jesus, but his kingdom won't be returned, won't, won't be fulfilled until he returns for his church. Now, if that idea sounds familiar to you, then I congratulate you because you've been paying attention. Because that really is the theme of Advent as well. Already, but not yet. We look back and we thank God for Jesus coming as a baby, and we look forward to the time when Jesus will return for his church and, thank, and, and look forward to that as well. Last summer, as our staff and I discussed our preaching schedule for 2023, we agreed that it'd be good for us to preach through one of the four Gospels at the start of the year. And as I began to look more closely at Mark's Gospel, I really felt like it could work for us to focus on the first part of his Gospel during the couple month, first couple months of the year, January and February. Is that coming from my mic? Do I need to go to the hand? You got one? Sound like something was crackling behind me. It was. All right. All right. Here we go. So I'm going to start at the beginning. No, I'm kidding. Um, um, realize that we could preach on the first couple of ten chapters during the first two months of January and February, and then during Lent we're going to continue our walk through Mark and look at Jesus' passion uh, kind of day by day. And so the first week of Lent we'll look at Palm Sunday and then kind of proceed uh, through the last week of Jesus' life. I've titled this first part of our study of Mark's Gospel, Glimpses of the Kingdom. Glimpses of the Kingdom. Because over the first 10 chapters of his book, Mark repeatedly communicates the news that God's kingdom has come near with the arrival of Jesus. And Mark's gospel begins with these words. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And then in verse 15, the last verse in our text today, Mark writes this. Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Now we're going to talk about this more as we look at Mark more closely. But Mark wastes no time in getting to his point. The point of letting his readers know that his purpose in writing is to share the good news of Jesus. That the kingdom of God has come near. And before we dig into verses 1 through 15, the passage we'll be looking at today, I want to give you some background about Mark, uh, just so you kind of have the context for Mark's purpose in writing, who he was, and who his audience was. The NIV commentary summarizes Mark's writing style with these words. Mark's gospel is a simple, succinct, unadorned, yet vivid account of Jesus' ministry, emphasizing more what Jesus did than what he said. Mark moves quickly from one episode in Jesus' life and ministry to another, often using the adverb immediately. And if you read Mark and kind of compare it with the other Gospels, you get to the end of it and you almost kind of have to take a breath because it's like he, he's rushing along. And then this happened. And then immediately they went here. And then immediately this happened. And that's kind of the way Mark writes. Mark, along with Matthew and Luke, are known as the synoptic Gospels because of the synopsis or summary they provide of Jesus' life and ministry. The first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, share many similarities with each other, and they differ significantly from John's Gospel, the fourth Gospel, which is more theological in nature. John selectively picks and chooses the events he shares to fit his theme, rather than giving kind of a broad overview of Jesus' life and ministry like Matthew and, and Luke and Mark do. 
since the time of the early church, it has been widely accepted that Mark's gospel is the apostles Peter's account of what he saw Jesus say and do firsthand. That Mark's gospel was based on the preaching of Peter and was arranged by Mark. So who was this guy Mark? Unfortunately, his name comes up several times in the New Testament. Mark's mother Mary was a prominent early Christian. And we know that her home served as a place, a meeting place, for the early believers because when Peter was in prison, and you might remember the angel miraculously released him, he immediately went to Mary's house, Mark's mother, because he knew that the believers were gathered there praying. And so we we know that Mark was kind of on the inside of the Christian church along with his mother. As a young man, Mark, who was known as John Mark, was an accomplice of Paul and Barnabas, on their first missionary journey. But when the missionaries encountered difficulty, he ended up deserting them and returning home to Jerusalem. Uh, Sometime later, and this is kind of what John Mark's probably most famous for other than writing the gospel, sometime later, Paul and Barnabas were getting ready to go on a second missionary journey, and Barnabas said, let's take John Mark along. John was Barnabas' cousin. "Let's, Let's take him along with us. And Paul said, no way. He deserted us before. We're not going to put ourselves in that position again. And they had such a strong uh, dispute about that that Paul ended up taking Silas and going on a missionary journey, and Barnabas and John Mark ended up going in a different direction. Now, later in Paul's, some of Paul's letters, Colossians and 2 Timothy, we learn that the relationship that was broken between Paul and Mark was repaired. Because Paul asked the church at Colossae to welcome Mark. And then in his second letter to Timothy, written from prison, Paul asked that Mark be sent to him because, and I quote, he is helpful to me in my ministry. And so this is just some of the background about who Mark was, the author of this gospel. Tradition held that Mark's gospel was written from Rome in the early to mid-60s of the first century A.D., which, if that's true, would make it the first gospel that was actually written down. For the first 30 years or so after Jesus' death, Christians were pretty much able to fly under the radar of the Roman Empire. Their views about Jesus weren't accepted. They might have encountered some resistance, but nobody paid them a lot of attention. But that all changed when Emperor, when, when Nero became the emperor. And Nero began to more systematically persecute the first century Christians. And as people who know history look back and look at it, it appears like he used the Christians as a scapegoat for his own kind of failing administration. It's believed that Peter and Paul were executed by Nero somewhere in the window of 64 to 69 BC. And Mark may well have been with Peter and possibly Paul. You remember Paul asked Mark to be brought to him while he was in prison at this time. And he could have written and sent his gospel then. We do know that the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in Rome in 70 AD, and that Mark's gospel appears to have been written before that. Unlike Matthew and Luke's gospels, which really are more biographies, Mark's kind of writes with a, with a pastoral purpose. As you read through his gospel, he's really encouraging believers to stand firm and to have courage in the midst of persecution. And so he really writes to them as a pastor. He wrote to the church at Rome, which was made up mostly of Gentile believers, seeking to provide comfort and assurance for them, living in a time of persecution that was growing more intense all the time. And so that's kind of some background for Mark. I know I threw a lot at you there, and some of that may be new to you. Um, You can find much of that material if you look at an intro to Mark kind of see some of those things about the dates and the audience and some of that. But I wanted to share that with you in this first week just to put in context what we'll be looking at over the next over the next, next number of weeks. The NIV commentary points out that Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2 verses 22 to 24 that he preached in the day of Pentecost really appears to serve as kind of a basic outline for Mark's gospel. And this is what Peter said. Fellow Israelites, Listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. 
This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death, nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And as you look at that little kind of mini sermon, you'll see kind of the progression of Mark. That Jesus came, he did miracles, signs, and wonders. He was handed over to the authorities, put to death, but God raised him from, to life. It's really a synopsis of what takes place in the Gospel of Mark. Mark's opening words in his Gospel, 14 words, are these. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, I don't know how many of you have looked at kind of ancient documents, but sometimes they have super long titles. Like some ancient books will have like 20, 30, 40 word titles. And so it's believed that that statement, the first verse of Mark, was actually intended as the title of Mark's gospel. And in that 14 word title or opening verse, we see some really um, loaded meaning behind the words and phrases that Mark uses. Mark is boldly proclaiming Jesus' superiority over any human emperor or ruler. And I want to sit on this for a little bit because in our culture, things are very different. But I want you to understand how radical uh, the nature of, how radical what Mark's saying here really was. He has three important phrases in that first verse. First, the word that's translated good news or gospel, euangelizo, was a word that was used to describe good news from the battlefield or regarding an emperor's proclamation. It was only used in reference to an emperor. And so Mark's initial readers would probably have been surprised to hear that word gospel used in a context other than speaking about the emperor. Again, Mark's being very clear and has a point in what he's trying to do. Next, he identifies Jesus as Messiah. The term Messiah had strong godlike overtones, which in that culture, again, were only associated with the emperor. Uh, finally, Mark designates Jesus as Son of God. Now, Son of God today is a word that we would associate with Jesus, and even many in our culture who might not uh, believe in Jesus or necessarily follow him would, if you say Son of God, would probably their minds would bounce to, oh, they're talking about Jesus. But at that time, across the Roman Empire, the phrase Son of God was reserved only for the person they considered to be the, roly, the Holy Roman Emperor. Now, due to the skepticism with which many of us view our rulers, it's hard for us to imagine our rulers as gods. But in the ancient world, and even in some cultures today, you'll hear, it's quite common. Now, I don't want to read this entire decree because it's lengthy and there's a lot of archaic language but I pulled out some of the phrases from a proclamation that went out about Caesar Augustus when he became emperor, emperor, because it gives us an idea of how they viewed themselves and the culture viewed them as deity. Listen to some of these statements. Augustus, the emperor, is the perfect consummation of human life. Augustus is filled with virtue. He's a benefactor among men and women. Augustus has been sent as a savior for us and for those who come after us. He will make war cease and create order for everyone. And this last one, the God's birthday, referring to Augustus, was the beginning for the world of the glad tidings that have come to all through him. From this day forward, Augustus' birthday will mark the beginning of the year when elected officials will resume public office. I mean, that's the kind of language and phrases that were associated with the emperor. They, they tried to um, communicate to the people that they were God, that they had been sent by God and placed there to rule. And so when Mark writes about Jesus and uses language like gospel and emperor's proclamation, son of God and Messiah, he was directly confronting the sovereignty, the supposed sovereignty, that the emperor had across the Roman Empire. This was a really radical statement that he's making right from the beginning. Augustus and his loyal followers may have viewed him as a god, but Mark's opening line pulls no punches 
in telling his reader there's only one God, and contrary to what you've been led to believe, it's not the emperor or any human being, it's Jesus Christ. And over the course of his gospel, Mark shares glimpses with his readers of what the kingdom of God looks like by giving them glimpses of the kingdom through things Jesus taught, through miracles that he did, through signs and wonders that he performed. As we walk through the sermon today, I want us to reflect on what some of the implications are for us that God's kingdom has come near in the person of Jesus. I've asked two of our teens, two guys, to come up and read the passage for us. Uh, you get to hear me talk enough, so I like these guys to read for us. And as they come, I want you to recognize that where we're going today is talking about the implications of what God's kingdom coming and Jesus being our Lord means for us. So keep that in mind as these guys read our passage. In the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for forty days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Thanks, guys. Let's give them a hand. appreciate you reading for us this morning. I mentioned in my intro that Mark doesn't waste any time in getting down to business. He immediately introduced Jesus as God, the Messiah. And he declares that God's kingdom has arrived by tying uh, Jesus' coming to two Old Testament prophecies. One from Malachi, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. And another from Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so right from the get-go, Mark is saying, this is the Messiah. This Jesus I'm telling you about is the one that the prophets foretold, and he's the one who has come as the Messiah, the Son of God. Mark goes on to summarize John the Baptist's words and ministry that were a forerunner uh, for Jesus' ministry. In his commentary on Mark, N.T. Wright likens Mark's introduction of John the Baptist and John the Baptist's words to a sleeper being woken from a deep sleep by having water thrown on his face and a bright light shined in his eyes. And he said that's essentially the way Mark's gospel starts. It's kind of like, boom, and he goes right into it. And he says, listen, Jesus the Messiah is coming, and you have to get ready for this. He called on the crowds to perk up, to get ready for the Messiah's arrival by repenting of their sins. He called them to prepare for the coming of the king and the establishment of the kingdom of God. N.T. Wright, uh, I really enjoy some of what he says and the way he says it. He, he, likens, um, he likens this to a saying that apparently they have in England. He said, the joke is that wherever the queen goes, now the king, uh, she smells fresh paint. Because everywhere she goes, everywhere he goes, people are sprucing things up. They're painting things. They're getting things ready. And that's kind of the way in which Mark is calling uh, people to be ready for the coming of the Messiah. He's saying the Messiah that you've waited for for 700 years has come. He's arrived. Get ready. And the way that you do that is by repenting. John the Baptist preached that message of repentance. He said, repent and be baptized. Get ready for the coming of the Messiah. 
Get yourself cleaned up, because the true king is coming. In verses 9 through 11, Mark recounts a very short but very significant occurrence. Jesus' baptism by John, and then God the Father's words of blessing as Jesus come up out, came up out of the water. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, we read that he looked up, and he had a vision of heaven being opened. He saw a new reality, and that view, along with God's word, changed everything for him. The voice of God from heaven declared, You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. N.T. Wright points out that while in one sense John's baptism was unique to him, he obviously was unique as God's son, the words God spoke over Jesus are the same words our Heavenly Father speaks to each of us who are in Christ. I love this statement. The whole Christian gospel could be summed up in this point. That when the living God looks at us, at every baptized and believing Christian, he says to us what he said to Jesus on that day. He sees us not as we are in ourselves, but as we are in Jesus Christ. God looks at us and says, you are my dear, dear child. I'm delighted with you. That's God's word of blessing over each of us to invite him into our lives. You are my dear, dear child. I'm delighted in you. That message propelled Jesus into his lifetime of ministry. And that word spoken over us as we accept Jesus into our lives is one that transforms us, that prepares us for all that God has for us. Jesus was now prepared to be sent out into the wilderness where he'd be tempted by his enemy, Satan. Tempted to take shortcuts to becoming king rather than walking the path of difficulty and suffering that God had in store for him. And similarly, as you and I hear God's word of blessing spoken over us, that we are his son or daughter in whom he is well pleased, we are also prepared to live in a different reality, God's kingdom, a place where we walk by faith, not by sight. We're prepared to go on our faith journey, withstanding the enemy's temptations and lies, and embracing the identity that has been spoken over us by our Heavenly Father, that we are Jesus' son, we are God's son, we're his daughter, he delights in us. This introductory, introductory section of Mark concludes with the news that after John the Baptist was imprisoned, Jesus began his official ministry in preaching and through, in preaching in, in proclaiming through his preaching and through his actions, the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. We read that Jesus started his ministry after John was put in prison. The John being taken out, so to speak, was Jesus' cue that it was time for his ministry to begin. The new thing God was doing and sending in Jesus demanded a response. It called for people to repent. And then in the succeeding verses, we see that it led disciples called to join him to say yes, to leave behind their lives of commercial fishing, to fish for people with Jesus. I've given you a lot of background today. We've talked about the beginning of Jesus' ministry and his uh, proclamation of the kingdom coming, his baptism where God declared you are my son with whom I am well pleased. Um, but I don't want us to miss the implications of what Mark is saying for us. And as we turn toward our conclusion, I want us to really begin to home in on what these words mean for us. What do they mean for you? What do they mean for me? Jesus' message, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news had significant implications for Jesus' first century audience and has significant implications for us as well. I'd like to have us think through this in several ways. And so as we head into this time, I just encourage you to really um, reflect on these words and these truths for yourself. Uh, sometimes it's easy for us to hear the truth of Scripture and just kind of accept it as a truth that's out there somewhere, but not necessarily truth for us. And so I want to encourage us, as we think about Jesus' kingdom coming, uh, as we think about Jesus' lordship in our lives, 
What are the implications of that for me and for you and for our lives? First of all, I'd like you to reflect again on the significance of God looking at you and declaring, you are my dear, dear child. I'm delighted with you. You are my dear, dear child. I'm delighted with you. Are you able to grasp that truth deep in your soul? Are you able to set aside your flaws, your past failures, weaknesses, current struggles, and accept that if you're in Christ, God looks at you and he says, you're my beloved daughter or son, and I'm delighted on you, in you. As you grasp that truth this morning, how does it change your view of yourself? How does it change your circumstances, your perspective? How does that empower you for the mission that God has for you of proclaiming his truth and his life and speaking that into the lives of others? If you do that not from a place of fear or insecurity or wondering how people will receive it, but if we do that from a place of saying, we're God's beloved son or daughter. We've been commissioned by him. He delights in us. He's empowered us for whatever this interaction we have with someone is, whatever these circumstances that we find ourselves in. You are my dear, dear child. I'm delighted in you. What implications does that have for us? Secondly, I'd like us to reflect on the implications of God's kingdom being here now, and Jesus being the Lord of our lives. Have you ever heard the statement, if Jesus isn't Lord of all, he's not Lord at all? Think about that in relation to your own life. If Jesus isn't Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. You may have heard it jokingly said about the guy who was baptized, and when he went to get under the water, he said to the pastor, wait a minute, and he pulled his wallet out of his pocket and held it up so his wallet didn't get baptized. He was willing to have all of himself baptized, but he wasn't quite willing to have his money given to God. Well, I think that's a picture for us of the way some of us live our lives, and we say, yeah, Jesus is our Lord, but this area of my life, yeah, not really ready for him to be Lord of that. If Jesus isn't Lord of all, he's not really Lord at all. What does it mean for you and me to fully embrace Jesus as our Lord? What are the implications of that for us? How does that impact us? As I reflect on Jesus' Lordship, as you reflect on Jesus' Lordship, is there an area of your life that you struggle to give him full Lordship over? Maybe it is your finances. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a health concern. Maybe it's a desire for prominence or fame or, or whatever. Maybe it's something that, a burden that you carry that it's just hard for you to let go of and let him fully take care of. Is there a step or steps that the Holy Spirit is asking you to take to dedicate this aspect of your life fully to Jesus? And I want to share these with you today on this front end, these questions, because I think as we mark, walk through Mark's gospel, and as we think about glimpses of the kingdom, these are the kind of issues that continue to come up. What are the implications of the fact that God's kingdom has come? What are the implications for us of the fact that Jesus is the Lord of our lives? How does that affect our lives? What changes do we need to make? John the Baptist called his audience, and then Jesus as well, call them to repent for the kingdom of God is near. That, that word repent means you're going in one direction and you, you turn and you go in another direction. What does it look like for us to repent? How will you and I respond to Jesus' lordship and to the reality that God's kingdom is here? That's what I'd like you to reflect on today. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up as they lead us in worship as I pray for us. And really throughout this series, as we continue to look at Mark's gospel and his emphasis on the kingdom. The kingdom of God has come. Jesus is Lord. He's Messiah. He's here.
Let's pray. Father, I thank you for sending Jesus. We've celebrated that during the Christmas season. But Lord, we also recognize that's not just something we give acknowledgement to for a couple weeks out of the year. It's a reality that we live our lives with. And so I pray for each of us today as we start this new year and as we begin to look at Mark's gospel and his proclamation about Jesus being the Messiah and God's kingdom coming near, I pray that each of us would wrestle with the implications of that for our lives. In any areas of our lives, Lord, that we need to more fully give to you, I pray that you would just gently put your finger on by your Holy Spirit and allow us to hand that to you. Allow us to, to repent, Lord, to be going in one direction and to turn and go in another direction. God, that you might truly be the Lord of our lives. I pray that your life would pervade us, every area of our lives, relationships, finances, worries or concerns that we have, our jobs, our dreams and our hopes, our past failures, that all of those would be brought under your lordship. Lord, I thank you for your love for us. I thank you that you look down on each of us as your sons and daughters and say, this is my son, this is my daughter in whom I'm well pleased. I pray this in Jesus' name.